Hi, Ray. Let me get starting soon. Do you check uh, Richard and Sebastian? Can you hear us? Hello. Hello. Uh, yeah, okay, great. Can you hear us? Yes. Yes. Okay. I'm here. Johar to everyone. Johar. But you is not very clear. Your voice is also sounding very stretchy. So, um, hmm? turn off this video. And your video is, um, I mean, we can see you, but perhaps, yeah, if you wanted to. Um, Turn the video off and you're speaking, then we might be able to hear you more clearly. Please try that twice. Please try that. Okay, so I think we'll get started. Sure. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today. And uh, I know it's a nice sunny day, so uh, there are better things to do uh, than coming to, to, to a lecture. Uh, which which is how it so was in my student days anyway. So I'm Praveen Kolaguri. I'm one of the uh, people behind uh, ILS. And uh, uh, for people who don't know what ILS is, uh, it's a, it, it stands for India Labour Solidarity. And we are an organization campaign uh, that is looking to uh, raise awareness of peoples and worker struggles in India and make the... Uh, Labor movement here aware of it and bring and and bring solidarity. Uh, so yeah, we are really glad that uh, th this conversation that we 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 wanted to uh, start about understanding labor in India has led to this meeting. Amika will touch more on that. So thank you so much for joining us and uh, please follow us on our socials and leave your email address with us. We'll be here after the meeting if you want to talk about anything else. So. I'll hand over to Mehika. 
Thanks, Praveen. Uh, I'm Nihika. I'm a lecturer in, in international development at the University of Bath, but I'm also a member and supporter of the ILS, um, you know, which um, uh, Praveen just uh, described. So I have the pleasure of introducing this series, and it's meant to be a series of talks uh, that we have uh, planned, that ILS has planned. And today is the first talk. And uh, the purpose of the series is really to shed more light and have a guided discussion by involving those who work with workers, uh, those who work on workers, and to really discuss issues that are quite significant to workers, uh, the landscape of work today uh, in India, but also workers' struggles. So what we are thinking about doing uh, uh, today is to really begin to map out what labor, what uh, the life of labor, and what livelihoods look like. Um, and then we will take this series forward and discuss uh, quite thematically uh, about women and work, uh, landless laborers um, and rural work, gig, the gig economy and gig workers, uh, but also try and make connections with the eventual purpose of trying to build solidarity across different worker groups in India. Um, then perhaps hopefully expanding to South Asia, but also thinking about workers who migrate from India to elsewhere, particularly UK to begin with. Um, so the aim is really to try and understand what workers and worker struggles look like today so we can think about building solidarities more transnationally. Um, so with that, I'm going to start today's uh, session, which is about mapping India's contemporary labor and we have um, three excellent speakers with us. Uh, so first up, we have Professor Jens Lerke. Um, Jens is Professor of Agrarian Labor Studies at SOAS. Jens is a preeminent scholar of labor in India, and he has been researching, he has researched extensively in uh, Northern India since uh, the early 1990s. I certainly as a student read Jens's work. Um, and his research uh, has focused on agrarian change, caste and labor relations including domestic labor migration. Um, so I am, we'll start with Jens, and Jens is going to open up the discussion about this ever-expanding informality and the informal space that uh, India's uh, labor inhabits. Jens. Shall I sit here or over there? Or... I think if you sit here, it might be clearer. Thanks so much, Nika, and the organizers of, of, of today. It's a, it's a pleasure to, to be here and, and, to, and to get a chance to, to, to take part in, in this uh, Indian Labor Solidarity event, which it's, it's a great initiative and, and it's great to, to be able to support it in, in my own small way. So um, I, I'm supposed to paint the broad picture of labor and informality in India. And of course, uh, we all know that from the 1990s, from neoliberalism, uh, India has seen astonishing growth rates. It has seen uh, a, 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 the, the, the proliferation of, of gleaming new cities, uh, international businesses, the global uh, commodity chains, uh, a huge market for certain sectors of, of, of the Indian, uh, the more well-off population and well major changes. We also probably know that uh, underneath this, there's a, 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 an underbelly that doesn't look quite as nice. Uh, so it's, it's, it's standard knowledge that throughout the 2000s, uh, the growth that India has experienced has been more or less jobless. It hasn't created work. And actually, since 2015, it has been jokingly said, if you're not so jokingly said, that it is job loss growth, that in spite of economic growth, uh, uh, the employment has fallen. Uh, and whatever employment that has been generated throughout this long period is practically all informalized work. Uh, so it is uh, the consequence of that is, among other things, that if we're looking at, at, at poverty in India, well, the uh, government of India has not published poverty figures since 2011, but if we look at the 2008 nine poverty figures, more than two thirds of, of the population find themselves below the then international poverty uh, line of $2 a day. More than two-thirds of the population, enormous amounts. 
people, or and more than 85% of the population earned less than uh, 10,000 rupees a month, which is what is deemed as an absolute minimum uh, according to international standards. At the same time, uh, inequality is rising. Uh, Thomas Piketty's World Inequality Report classify India as one of the most unequal societies in the world, and inequality is increasing. There's also major variations within the country. I can't deal with that here, but hopefully some of the other speakers and over the, over the, over the, uh, the course of the series will, will get into more of that. Uh, in addition to this, uh, 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 the, these very poor conditions that exist are not equally distributed among people that work. There is clear major patterns of structural discrimination at force in the labor market. 25% uh, of Indian populations belong to the indigenous people, Adivasis, and that is the ex untouchable groups. And on top of that, maybe 10% extra are actually also Dalits that have converted to Islam, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So we're talking 200 million people at least, 300 million people maybe. Um, and they find themselves at the bottom of society, both when it comes to poverty. Poverty is much higher in, among them than among other groups. I can give you the figures, but I'll. I will throw many figures at you, but I'll, I'll pass on that one for now. Uh, and they also uh, are discriminated against in the sense that uh, there is unequal pay. It's documented well that within the same job, there are unequal pay with Adivasis, Dalits, and Muslim and women uh, getting less paid on average than high caste men, men do. Uh, uh, the ed educational premium for uh, Dalis and Adivas is, is also less when it comes to jobs. You don't get as good a job, even if you have the same education. And the, 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 the discrimination in who gets white collar job is well documented as well. It is not Adivas, uh, uh, Dalis, and certainly not Muslims. Um, of course, there's also a gender gap pay, which is not specific to India, but it is also in India. And what is specific to India is that the work Force participation ratio, the proportion of women that are actually having an income is extraordinarily low. It's 24% of the population. In most places it's 60, 70%. In India, it is that low. Of course, it's not because women don't work, they just don't work in paid work. So it is more to do with the way they work and what is considered paid work and what is not. So that is some very general big picture figures. If, uh, if one should move on to so what sort of work it is this majority of the population that are not well off do. Then a figure that is standard figure, but nevertheless totally correct. And India has some good overall statistical data on many aspects, including on this. 90% um, of the working population are informalized laborers. And that figure has been pretty constant since, since the 1990s. This is from 2018 um, what does it mean? Well, it means that they work with no labor contract, they have no job security, they can be fired any day, there are no employment rights, there are no welfare benefits, no health insurance, no pensions, no access to social security, and they have de facto no rights to organize as a union. Then they work very long working days. Uh, for example, a research project I was in charge of uh, involving very good people um, showed that uh, it, well, it's 10 years ago in, in the garment sector in Delhi, average uh, uh, hours of, of, of work were 10 to 12 hours a day. In construction, it was 10 to 11 hours a day. And during peak season, it would go up to 15, 16 hours a day. Uh, they're paid much less than formal workers and standard anywhere in between a quarter and two thirds of what a formal worker with a formal contract is being paid. So that means that for a working month of 26 to 28 days, because you work at least six days a week, um, a, a wage between 6,000 and 9,000 is not uncommon. It can be less, it can be more, but that is, that is a standard figure. Um, and of course, this is within these quite appalling working conditions with safety non-existence, where the housing is is for, for example, just to rent a room in a slum it shows that you are better off of the informalized laborers. Those the others would sleep at the floor where they work, or they will sleep in labor camps. Uh, so, so that is the conditions we're talking about. Um, now, 
So far, I've spoken as if these workers are workers that are employed. It is not so that all workers are employed and have an employer. Of course, everyone, uh, the huge proportion that are also self-employed. Within agriculture, and 42% of the population work in agriculture, of course, you are self-employed unless you work for the, for the farmer. Outside of agriculture, um, uh, around 40% uh, uh, of the population are also self-employed. They are, and they tend to be poorer than, than the rest. So they haven't even been in a position to find a job that can be paid. So they have to make up uh, a, a job themselves, so to speak. Um, and so, so that is also important to, to be aware of when we talk about informalized labor, because they are, of course, also informalized. No, no guarantee anywhere uh, for income. Um, now, um, so if we look at informal labor outside of agriculture, because it's taken for granted within agriculture, everyone is informalized. And of course, 80% uh, of, of, of farmers own less than two hectares, two hectares of land, 70% own less than one hectare of land. So to live off your agriculture is the impossible. So you have your agriculture and you work outside as well. And now if we're looking at what goes on outside of agriculture, then um, nearly, Two thirds of the working population outside of agriculture are informalized. So we've reached it. So all, everyone in agriculture, and nearly two thirds outside of agriculture, are, are informalized. What does it mean? Well, there's the informal sector, and there's to be an informal labor. There's the huge informal sector, which is defined really as those that employ less than, than, than 10 workers, those factories or units that employ less than 10 workers. There's more to it than that, but that is a crude. Thick. Uh, um, now, uh, so that is one thing. That is what you maybe think of as informalized labor. But astonish astonishingly, up towards 60% of all workers in the formal sector, in the big factories that produce the, the cars, the, the garments, uh, the, 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 the fridges, all the big things, they are also informalized. They have no contracts, they have no uh, uh, conditions, uh, they have no union, they are actually not, they're often not employed by the employer, but by a labor contractor that hire them, that, that throw them in whenever they, they're needed. Uh, and they have never worked for more than a year at a time, because if they do that, then they get certain rights. So they get kicked out within a year. They will also have different uniforms to the others so that everyone can see that you're not a real uh, worker here. They will have different canteens sometimes. They, in, anyways, so clearly discriminated within the workplace. And that is the majority of workers, even in the leading factories. Um, so um, um, who are these workers we're talking about there? Well, uh, a large proportion of them are seasonal migrant laborers. And this is where, uh, that is, this is an area where uh, Indian statistics, statistics fails us. There has not been a payment to proper to probably figure out how many workers that are uh, uh, that are internal seasonal migrants, because they're the ones that are the worst off. But standard among academics is to say between 60, uh, 60 million and 100 million. So we actually don't know how many there are. So but my my estimate is it's closer to 100 million than, than to 60 million. And and just so the workforce, the workforce in India, people in work in India is around. 450 million goes up and down a bit. So, so a huge proportion of the workforce are seasonal migrant laborers. Um, among them, um, uh, the the um, so to be a seasonal migrant laborer, how can you be a seasonal migrant laborer? Well, you come from the countryside most often. You're born there. You uh, your your family lives there. Uh, so you're being socialized there. You're being taken care of as a child. When you have finished a seasonal labor, you go back to the village live there in your old age because you have no pension, et cetera, et cetera. So it means where, where maybe we think of as employment uh, as something that should should uh, uh, sustain your family. Uh, it is just not at all the case. It's the family that sustain that you can work as a seasonal labor. So we, myself, Abbasha and others that have worked on this, we call this super exploitation because it is exploitation where, where the employers even have externalized the social cost of, 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 of reproducing the labor. Um, so this kind of, but, but if we think of seasonal migration in that sense, then if we have say 100 million or even just 60 million seasonal migrant laborers, and if they all come from families with four people in the family, we're talking up to 400 million people that somehow are involved 
in seasonal migration, even if they do not migrate. So it's a huge proportion of the in the rural uh, population that 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 is relating related to seasonal migration or affected by it. Jan Berman called, called the seasonal migrants for witch hunters and gatherers, and that is quite precise. They try and find where wherever they can. Um, now, uh, I'm not quite sure how much time I got left. Probably not much. Uh, but but if uh, but also among seasonal migrant neighbors, there's there are major di discriminatory practices in place. Those that get the worst job among seasonal migrants are Dalits and Adivasis, and some Muslims, those from the lower parts of, of Muslim communities as well. Uh, there's no data on this. There's only uh, uh, case studies, and it shows again and again that when we look at the worst worst sectors for employment, which is agriculture, which is brick kilns. Which is construction. Uh, we find the in those sectors uh, probably the, the majority of workers being Dalits or Adivasis. Now, of course, uh, they make up around, as I say, around twenty five percent of the population. Uh, whereas other groups that are outside the high caste make up around forty percent of the population. So, so uh, they might Dalits and Adivasis might not always be the majority of. Of a group of labourers, but they, they can be disproportionately represented. So even if uh, so, if if you get the, the gist that, that you can you can it, uh, for the Dalits a sector can be extremely important, even if uh, numerically fifty percent of those that are employed are from from other castes, because that is the only jobs they can work. Uh, so that matters, for example, when it comes to uh, um, employment in in uh, in factories. Uh, in factories, uh, the majority are not Dalits and, and Adivasis, but mainly other backward caste OBCs. Uh, but if we're looking at the worst jobs there, again, it's Dalits and Adivasis. And I have some some appalling examples of this, which I haven't really got the time to to give you. But just one um, a factory in in Tamil Nadu, which was. Uh, um, research by a, a colleague of mine, Donegan, uh, shows that, that the, 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 the dirty and demeaning job of, of uh, it was a, the, it was producing dinner time, the, the, the dirty, demeaning hard work of taking cow bones, putting them into a chemical uh, uh, rinsing process and creating the, the gel. Uh, that work was done by local Dalits and uh, Adivasi uh, migrant workers. Uh, who came in when the local artists went on strike, and therefore, uh, what what do the employer do? They get in the migrant workers, and we see that again and again and again. And then so by, by Adivasi, in particular, but also Dalit migrant workers from elsewhere, uh, step in to stop labor action from local uh, low workers. But it is these groups that have the worst job. We go up one rung and look at the electricians being looking at the foreman. Then they are from better. Established caste in the local area. They have the jobs of being in charge of the others. And that so that was what that case showed so nicely, so to speak. Um, two minutes. Now, why do people then do this? Why do they do this work? Well, they haven't got much options, and to them, these are the best options. Even say a brick kiln work where you will often work through labor contractors, meaning that you will some in many cases, in the worst cases, you will you will. Uh, have to take out a loan before the work starts because you need the money to survive the dry season. Uh, and then you're tied into the labor contractor while you work for some months until you pay back the loan. And then you have to wait to be paid for the job. So you have to stay on until longer. So that is what the international labor organization very often would call uh, forced labor. Um, uh, even those people that do that, it's study after study show they do it because it's the best option they have. They know what they're doing. They do it because they... Economic pressure means this is the best they can they can get. Of course, there are others that get slightly better job, which is totally free. It's just not very well paid. Uh, but uh, uh, labor contractors have a major role in this. And um, uh, to uh, people come from places where agricultural development for the, for 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 Adivasis, where 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 uh, uh, land grab by mining uh, for. Uh, um, Dams, etc., means that that the original way of living for Adivasis becomes much more difficult, and they also want more money. So what do they do? They have to migrate for this. Or Dalits that have never had land, and therefore always have had to work uh, for 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 a wage. They find these jobs 
better uh, than the few jobs that are available within, within agriculture back home for a number of reasons. It's, um, when they migrate, one should also consider that they have no citizen rights. Uh, they have no labor rights, of course, but they also have no access to the to the existing social systems that are in place in India, public distribution system, which is cheap or, or free food, um, uh, social security, housing, schooling. Uh, they have no rights. They have no voting rights locally either. So they've got no political pressure to put on the local authorities. Um, okay, so just a few words here towards the end. What is happening these years? There, there are some changes. In, in India, there, there's new labor laws coming in, in place. And, and I can't talk much about this, and others probably are more experts than this. But it is the case that uh, government of India are putting new labor laws in place that are being decried as worse than, is, than what was there. That is true. It is also the case that they probably will not mean anything for informalized labor, because it is they have no right anyway. The laws that were before were not implemented for informalized labor, and often there were exemptions made for them. So the new labor laws, which is more so taking the informalized labor, their condition, and saying we should make formal, formal labor condition a bit more like them. And of course, one should be against it, but it is not the main issue for informalized labor that labor rights are being uh, uh, diminished. Because they didn't happen anyway. Um, there is a change. Some, uh, some people would point to this as a positive change. There is a small increase in so-called regular employment in India through labor contractors that are uh, registered uh, that are on the books, and, uh, and they will deliver laborers uh, to the big companies, to the big uh, uh, car industries, South of Delhi, to uh, the Amazon warehouses. Uh, and, and you have to go... You have a signed contract and it's all about board. So you go from being so-called casual labor where you have no contract to this kind of work where you have contract, you have some kind of social security, you have actually paid a bit more as well. You, you might be paid bit up to 11,000, 12,000 maybe, as opposed to eight, 9,000. Um, is this good? Well, it's maybe not bad, but <laughs> it, is, it, is, it, is, it, it is to all intents and purposes, a way of regularizing the appalling conditions of informalized labor. Uh, so that now you are still informalized, but you have a one month contract or a three months contract. So, and you have, you will have some, some benefits from that, but compared to the labor rights of formal laborers, the way they used to be, and it was, I mean, formal labor are not living, uh, 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 fantastic life, lots of money, but, but compared to them, this is still at a totally different level, much lower level. There is that change, and if you read sort of the pro-government uh, literature on, on, on labor market developments, they will highlight this change, and it is, it is real. It, to me, it looks as what, what the big industry is interested in. Maybe also the corporate social responsibility agendas are interested in making, making the rules above board, making it look better, and, and also making it a tiny bit better. But, but so qualitatively, it is still at the same level as what we have spoken about, as, as what I've spoken about here with regards to informalized labor. And I think I'll leave it there in this uh, sad story. I could also have, have talked about the activists on the ground that are doing fantastic work, and, and, and some of them have really won important victories. And so that is also taking place in spite of all this. But I think my brief was to, was to give this overview, so, so, so I'll stop here. Thanks, Ian. Uh, I think uh, we will definitely talk about the small wins and the big wins. And uh, um, but I think the important point here uh, that uh, you brought out so well is the fact that there's this shift towards regularizing informal labor and um, the role of the contractors and contractual labor and what that poses as challenges uh, insofar as organizing workers are concerned. Um, so with that, uh, thanks, Jens. We will move on to our um, second speaker, um, very much uh, on the ground working with uh, uh, laborers on a, uh, on a daily basis, um, Richa Singh. Uh, Richa Singh is the founding member um, of uh, Sangtin Kisan Mazdoor Sangatan, SKMS. SKMS is a people's movement in Sitapur district in central UP, and it emerged from the collective writing and reflections of Sangtin, a group formed by rural women to shape change in their lives and that of their communities. 
SKNS members are mainly marginal farmers or landless laborers. More than 90% of the 8,000 members identify as Dalits, with women and men being equally represented. So, Richa, uh, Richa ji, thanks so much for joining us. I know it's a Saturday and you have a family function to go to. But um, um, Richa is going to speak to us about laboring women from landless households, uh, primarily, uh, if not most, are Dalit. And uh, very much speaks to what Jens has already identified about having a patchwork of multiple livelihoods across rural spectrum. Um, and, uh, and, and Richa ji is going to talk more about that. Uh, Richa, um, you feel uh, if you when, whenever you speak in Hindi and if there is translation required, I will do my best to translate. Uh, but uh, but uh, thank you so much for joining and over to you. Uh, Jindabad, Jindabad to all of you. Uh, Mihika, uh, I will speak in Hindi. Uh, I can't speak in English. Or ये बात कहते हुए ये भी कहना चाहती हूँ कि बहुत सारे लोग हैं हमारे जैसे जिनके जीवन में जिनका जीवन ही अपने आप में ऐसे स्ट्रगल्स के साथ होता है कि कोई और लैंग्वेज सीख सके ऐसा मौका ही उनके जीवन में नहीं आता है और उनमें से ही मैं भी एक हूँ आप हिंदी में बात कीजिए हम लोग यहाँ पे एक बात चलाते रहेंगे जी so, so uh, yes, um, so basically, Richard ji said that, you know, there are enough people who are struggling every day on a daily basis, and the struggles don't allow them to learn more than what uh, life poses to them on an everyday basis, such as learning a new language. And Richard ji is uh, one of those members. So she will speak in Hindi, and I will translate, and Lopita yeah. is going to help yeah. us translate. Uh, SKMS... मजदूरों किसानों और महिलाओं और युवाओं का एक संगठन है जैसा मेहिका ने कहा 99 परसेंट यहाँ दलित साथी हैं जब हम एक मजदूर की बात करते हैं कि मजदूर तो एक व्यक्ति है एक परिवार है उस मजदूर के साथ और वही जब कहीं जब एम जी के साथ काम करता है तो वो मनरेगा मजदूर होता है वही जब खेत पर काम करता है तो वो फॉर्म लेबरर होता है वही जब किसी बिल्डिंग कंस्ट्रक्शन में काम करता है तो वो निर्माण मजदूर होता है कुल मिलाकर एक एक व्यक्ति है एक दलित गरीब व्यक्ति है एक परिवार है जो अपने जीवन को चलाने के लिए बहुत अलग अलग तरह से स्ट्रगल करता है और अपने अपने जीवन यापन के लिए रिसोर्सेस इकट्ठे करता है अलग अलग काम करते हुए यू विल ट्रांसलेट मेहिका बिल्कुल मैं अभी ट्रांसलेट करती हूँ uh it was uh, quite a powerful thing that she said she said that uh, you know uh, so firstly 99% of the skms workers um are dalits and uh, when we talk about workers uh, we are talking about individuals and families and that same person that same worker is a landless agricultural laborer while working on the field but that same laborer is also the construction worker and that same laborer is also um, you know while while working in in a mine is the mine worker so it is it is what she is talking about this absolutely complex livelihoods that they try and patch together uh, for their uh, lives so it is important to think about the worker not just as a as an abstract category of worker but all those different work that they are trying to do to uh, bring livelihood to themselves and their families aur yehi mazdoor jab kheton mein kaam karta hai apne khet mein to wo kisan hota hai agar hum sirf skms ya ya uttar pradesh ke hisab se dekhe to मैक्सिमम लेबरर ऐसे हैं जिनके पास वन एकर से भी कम लैंड होता है और ये बहुत छोटा खेत है कई बार तो इतने छोटे खेत होते हैं कि कुछ बड़े लोगों लोगों के घर भी उससे बड़े होते हैं और इतने छोटे खेत में काम मतलब इतने छोटे खेत से जो उपज होता है जो प्रोडक्शन होता है पर वो उनके लाइफ के लिए पूरा नहीं पड़ता है 
मतलब पेट भरने का भी काम नहीं करता है फिर वो करते ये है कि कॉन्ट्रैक्ट फार्मिंग पे जाते हैं बहुत अलग अलग तरीके हैं कॉन्ट्रैक्ट फार्मिंग के एक ऐसा तरीका है कि वो बटाई पे लेते हैं कि जो भी फसल होगी उसका 50 परसेंट हम मतलब जो मेन लैंड ओनर है उसको दे देंगे और 50 परसेंट मजदूर के पास होगा इसमें अगर समझे तो कि ये जो खेती है इस खेती से मजदूर को पूरा नहीं पड़ता और इसलिए वो एम जी एन आर जी ए जैसे वर्क को बहुत लगकर दिल से चाहता है और वो ऐसे अलग अलग रोजगार ढूंढता है जिसको वो करके अपने परिवार को चला सके इस तरह के छोटे मजदूर किसानों में कई संकट आए क्योंकि ये दूसरे के खेतों में काम करते थे और वहां से भी अपने जीविकापार्जन के लिए रिसोर्सेस इकट्ठा करते थे मैं दो तीन चीजों पर ध्यान दिलाना चाहूंगी कि जैसे ही बड़ी मशीनें आई तकनीकी ने हमको बहुत सारे ऐसी चीज दी जिससे कि मैं आपसे बात कर पा रही हूँ इतनी दूर बैठे लेकिन दूसरी तरफ हमारी तकनीकी ने बहुत सारे लोगों के रोजगार को छीन लिया ये जो छोटे मजदूर किसान थे ये खास तौर से सोइंग और हार्वेस्टिंग सीजन में इनको जबरदस्त काम मिलता था खेतों में और जैसे ही जैसे ही ट्रैक्टर और कंबाइन मशीन आ गए इनके हाथ से इनका ये रोजगार छीन गया और दूसरी तरफ जो दूसरा दूसरा अगर ध्यान दे कि पूरा जो मौसम परिवर्तन है जो मतलब क्लाइमेट चेंज है मैं आप लोगों को दो एग्जांपल देना चाहूंगी 2022 में सर्दियों के बाद अचानक बहुत जल्दी गर्मी आ गई जिससे जो वीट क्रॉप था वो बहुत बहुत कमजोर हो गया एक तरह से हम कह सकते हैं कि 50 परसेंट ही की प्रोडक्शन लोगों के हाथ में आया 2023 में जब पूरी फसल खेत में थी और हार्वेस्टिंग सीजन सामने था अचानक बहुत तेज बारिश हुई ओले पड़े और लोगों की फसल बर्बाद हो गई तो ये कह सकते हैं कि वन एकर लैंड में अगर 15 क्विंटल वीट होता तो वो 8 टू 20 क्विंटल में आ गया तो एक तरह से जो लागत थी फार्मिंग की वही मुश्किल से निकल पाई और चूंकि कॉन्ट्रैक्ट पर है तो इनको वो अपना अपनी अनाज या जो भी कैश में भी कई बार कॉन्ट्रैक्ट होते हैं तो वो तो उनको लैंड ओनर को देना ही पड़ा फसल का कोई इंश्योरेंस नहीं है अगर कहीं है भी तो वो मिल पाना अपने आप में रिचा जी मुझे रुक, रुक सकते हैं जी हम थोड़ा हाँ, रिचा जी मैं थोड़ा ट्रांसलेट कर देती हूँ नहीं तो मैं भूल जाऊंगी आपके सब पॉइंट्स बिल्कुल स्कीमेंटेंटेंटेंटेंटेंटेंटेंटेंटेंटेंटेंटेंटेंटेंटेंटेंटेंटेंटेंटेंटेंटेंटेंटेंटेंटेंटेंटेंटेंटेंटें
So Richa started by also reminding us that you know the same worker when they are when is working at the construction site or is asking for uh, work on through this uh, state scheme of uh, guaranteed employment is also the worker uh, who is a peasant when working on uh, their own uh, plot of land. And the workers that she's talking about are workers who own less than one acre of land, which is a very small plot size. Um, so she's, she wanted to highlight a couple of points as to why it is important for the workers to patch together livelihood from so many different sources. Uh -huh. um, so one of the things that's quite uh, key, and this is again where the subnational variation in India becomes so important in terms of, you know, uh, the kind of land holding, the kind of crops that people grow and the kind of labor um, arrangements that we see. Um, so in central uh, UP, um, um, Richa is talking about how um, you know a contract farming has become uh, has always been and is becoming extremely important in terms of how um, crop how how uh, the workers uh, are involved in agriculture. So contract farming is when um, you know the the workers not only just work on their land but they might be renting uh, in land from other workers. Jens is here. Jens can uh, talk about it if uh, supplement um, what I'm describing. But contract farming is when they also work on other people's land uh, with an arrangement that uh, whatever is grown on the land is shared with uh, the um, person who owns the land. So between the landowner and these agriculture workers who are also peasants but also go on to work as as contract farmers elsewhere, they uh, share their uh, land. So that is what she was talking about when she was talking about Batwara. Usually it's 50% of the crop. What she's talking about is that, um, and this is uh, quite important in, in the way she described about uh, climate change in 2020 and how the climate crisis is playing out. She said that, you know, uh, it was uh, in, in 2022 wheat, which is the primary crop that she was describing, uh, there was untimely heat and then there was an also a bout of untimely hail that meant that uh, the crop production went down by 15%. So if on a one acre plot, it was 15 quintal of wheat that one can grow, it went down to about seven to eight quintal, while the farmer, the sharecropper, um, had to uh, still give the amount of uh, um, crops as rent to work on the land to the landowner. So this really squeezes the income of the worker, which also means that there's a big demand for this uh, rural employment uh, guarantee scheme and the jobs that come from rural employment guarantee. While that is being whittled down and uh, you know is being sucked uh, off funds. Um, so while employment, this guaranteed employment in rural areas is uh, hard to access, it is becoming ever more important to the farmers and the peasants. So that was one dynamic she described. The other one was the fact that uh, big machines have been replacing the kind of work that a lot of the peasant workers um, uh, and the landless laborers would do on field. So there is another element that is uh, tightening the sources of income for these, this particular group of workers that uh, Richard's organization works with. Um, so yeah, so these are the two factors that she has uh, described. Um, uh, Richa ji, up team number uh, factor. Yeah, no, sorry, no, sorry, no, just the climate one. I just wanted to clarify that because I think that was important. There was in 22, 2022, there was sudden heat, so the, the crop didn't grow only. Then in 20, it was in 2023 that there was uh, un, untimely rain. So in two consecutive years, for two different reasons, because of the unpredictable climate changes, there was effect on the earnings of, of them. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks so much. Um, Richa ji, so you were number point pe shayad, uh, batane wali thi. to tell us about three points. So we have to ki demand and you have to discuss about sharing and cropping, we have to discuss that. Yes, I आप जब ट्रांसलेट कर रही हैं तो मैं वो पॉइंट तो समझ लेती हूँ बस बोलना मुश्किल होता है तो इन सब के बीच में आ, मतलब अगर मैं फार्मिंग को थोड़ा सा और कुछ पॉइंट्स रखना चाहूँगी कि इस तरह के जो छोटे मजदूर किसान हैं इनका जीवन अगर पारंपरिक खेती को देखें तो ये सिर्फ खेत पे नहीं था इनका जीवन इनके जंगलों पर था इनका जीवन नदी पर था तालाब थे जहां बहुत मछलियां होती थी ऐसे सड़कों के किनारे 
रिचा जी अचानक आपकी आवाज खत्म हुई कुछ हुआ क्या आपकी तरफ से अभी आ रही है अभी आ रही है आ, देखो भाई ये डिजिटल इंडिया है लेकिन नेटवर्क ऐसे ही चलता है ठीक <laughs> <laughs> है तो अभी ठीक है ना अब आ रही है हाँ तो बस ये कि पूरी जो पारंपरिक खेती थी खेती सिर्फ एक जमीन का एक छोटा सा टुकड़ा नहीं था जहां अनाज लगाते थे खेती खेती में जंगल भी थे खेती में बाग भी थे हमारी नदियां हमारे तालाब भी थे ऐसी ऐसे सारे जो एक पूरा सिस्टम था एक बहुत अच्छी प्रणाली थी फार्मिंग को लेकर कई कई प्रॉब्लम्स भी थे लेकिन जो खूबसूरत चीजें थी वो भी धीरे धीरे एक तरह से पूरी तरह से खत्म हो गए तो जो ये बटोर कर खाना खाते थे जंगल से जो फल लाते थे दूध जो दूध का कोई सेल नहीं था तो ऐसी जो चीजें इनके पास पहुंचती थी वो इनको इनके भूख से बचा ले जाती थी और साथ में न्यूट्रिशन भी मिल जाता था आज स्थिति बिल्कुल बदल गई है सब कुछ कैश क्रॉप पर चला गया है तो अगर हम देखें ये फिर कभी डिस्कशन हो सकता है कि किस तरह से आज से 50 साल पहले जो मजदूर 75 केजी का वेट कैरी कर सकता था आज 25 केजी भी कैरी नहीं कर पा रहा है ये अगर देखे तो मजदूर साथियों के पूरे हेल्थ का या पूरे मेल न्यूट्रिशन का भी एक मामला साथ साथ चल रहा है चलिए तो मैं बेसिकली रिया जी टॉकिंग अबाउट हाउ वेन शीज टॉकिंग अबाउट फार्मिंग शीज टॉकिंग अबाउट हाउ इट वॉज नॉट जस्ट द फैमिली लैंड दैट वॉज अ सोर्स ऑफ न्यूट्रिशन सोर्स ऑफ रिसोर्स बट ऑल्सो द फैक्ट दैट यू नो अबाउट Dec- about even a decade or well two two three decades ago there was uh, the possibility of accessing resources from common common property resources from forests from water from rivers uh, um, so you know there was sort of a larger um, uh, pool of resources that uh, people could access food and nutrition from and um, so it was not just linked to agriculture from titled agricultural land and uh, um did i miss anything no i think that that's that's, that's, that's the main fish, point is but you could get fish from the river well, yeah you could get fish from the river we'll so the 75 kilograms and 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 the fact that you know uh, a lot of um, uh, about, almost about 75 kg of what was it she, she was she was saying that we that would wait a person could carry, carry so because of all that nutrition yeah right in the past so in basically richard's point is about the declining nutrition because of uh, um uh, how access is mostly marketized incre- increasingly so i would i leave it at that yeah. also also ca- cash crop nutrition because agriculture has been turned into cash crops mm-hmm. that's then you extended the the, the big farmers fields so the forests the lakes <laughs> environmental change all all those resources are gone in sab ke beech mein एम जी एन आर जी ये एक, एक सहारे के रूप में लोगों के सामने आया एक उम्मीद के साथ आया कि हमें हमें अपनी रोजमर्रा की जरूरतों के लिए अब कहीं शहरों की तरफ पलायन नहीं करना पड़ेगा बल्कि हमें हमारे गांव में रोजगार मिल पाएगा ये रोजगार मिल पाना कितना मुश्किल हो रहा है इसको अभी थोड़ी देर पहले कह रहे थे कि इस साल एम जी एन आर जी में थर्टी टू परसेंट बजट की कटौती की गई है ऐसे हालत में एम जी एन आर जी ए से काम मिलना अपने आप में बहुत मुश्किल हो गया है एम जी एन आर जी ए से हमारे हम सब अपने इलाकों में देख पाते हैं कि हमें पिछले आठ दस सालों से पिछले पंद्रह सालों से अपने इलाके में ही हंगर डेथ हमें होते हुए नहीं दिखे हैं क्योंकि एम जी एन आर जी वो सहारा दे देता है हर किसी मजदूर को जो भी काम करना चाहते हैं 
एम जी एन आर जी में जो एक बहुत अच्छी और खूबसूरत बात हो पाई कि सीतापुर में 2006 के पहले जब एम जी एन आर जी नहीं था तो जो विमेन लेबर थी उनके वेजेस और मेल लेबर के वेजेस में अंतर था डिफरेंस था महिलाओं को कम मजदूरी मिलती थी लेकिन चूंकि एम जी एन आर जी में सबको एक बराबर के वेजेस थे इसके तुरंत बाद अभी आप कहीं भी जाएं फॉर्म में जाएं ईट भट्टे पे जाएं कहीं भी जाएं तो जो विमेन के जो वेजेस थे वो मेल लेबर के इक्वल मिलने लगे और ये हमें बहुत बड़ी उपलब्धि लगती है हाँ थैंक यू um she said something quite beautiful which i will translate in exactly in her words she said that uh, something there was something quite beautiful about the narega scheme which is that it uh, you know uh, in the last 8 to 10 years um there has not been hunger deaths which had been i suppose common to the uh, sitapur district before that and primarily because narega has been a lifeline for those who do who have to patch together these livelihoods and the second thing that she mentioned about narega is that uh, um, she said that you know uh, before narega came in there was uh, even through narega there was um, uh, at the time of narega when when in narega first came in there was difference between what men and women earned through manual work but uh, the good implementation of and and where where in this industries and this is this certainly true for outside of up as well where uh where uh, narega had pushed a kind of equity between men and women's or parity between men and women's uh, wages and um and she was talk and she said that you know uh, even if they went and worked outside of narega in a in a kiln or um in in any sort of construction work they could demand a kind of uh, more of a parity between men and women uh, uh, and then wages that they earned primarily because narega pushed for that Yeah, but in and Narega now the budget has been cut by thirty two percent. Yeah. So that is a huge um pro uh, issue for for the laborers who would much rather get uh, Manrega work because you can stay in your own place and do this work rather than having to then go to the urban areas in search of work and become those migrant laborers. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and I just technique ki baat. स्टार्टिंग में कही थी वही टेक्निक की बात फिर से एम जी जी के साथ होता है ट्रांसपेरेंसी के नाम पे विदाउट करप्शन के लिए कि करप्शन न हो इसके नाम पर इतना ज्यादा तकनीकीकरण हो चुका इतना ज्यादा टेक्निक ला दी गई है एम जी जी में कि वो मजदूर साथियों के हाथ से बाहर होता चला जा रहा है जैसे एक मैं एक दो एग्जांपल दूंगी कि एक आया नेशनल मोबाइल मॉनिटरिंग सिस्टम एनएमएमएस इट मींस कि अटेंडेंस एनएमएमएस ऐप के थ्रू लगेगा मजदूर साथी इस डिजिटल इंडिया में आज भी बहुत सारे लोग हैं जिनके पास मोबाइल नहीं है मोबाइल नंबर को भी कंपलसरी करने की तरफ है हमारी सरकार तो ये एन में अटेंडेंस लगाना कहीं सर्वर नहीं है कहीं नेटवर्क इशू है इस तरह के इतनी मुश्किल है कि मजदूर काम कर लेते हैं लेकिन उनका अटेंडेंस नहीं लग पाता ये एक दूसरा एबीपीएस आधार बेस्ड पेमेंट सिस्टम जिसको कंपलसरी कर दिया गया है और हमारे एक लगातार स्ट्रगल के बाद देश भर के ऐसे तमाम लोगों के स्ट्रगल के बाद थर्टी जून तक थोड़ी रियायत की गई है आधार का पूरा लिंक का काम जो बैंक के माध्यम होता है से होता है उनकी कैपेसिटी इतनी कम है कि वो लिंक ही नहीं कर पा रहे और जिनका आधार लिंक नहीं हो रहा है उनको एन जी एन आर जी में, में उनके नाम का मास्टर रोल जो पूरा अटेंडेंस सीट है वो नहीं निकल पा रहा है तो एक तरह से हम जो पूरी तकनीकी है मजदूर साथी हमारे गांव के एक महिला मजदूर कहती है कि हमें समझ में नहीं आता ये सब पढ़े लिखे इंजीनियर क्यों हमारे ही मजदूरी के पीछे पड़ गए हैं सरकार के साथ साथ 
तो ये एक इतनी मुश्किल की चीज होती जा रही है कि एम जी एन आर जी जो लाइफ लाइन बनकर आई आज की डेट में हमें ऐसा लग रहा है कि बस वो अपनी अंतिम सांस से गिनने की तरफ है सो शी इज टॉकिंग अबाउट हाउ दिस स्कीम नरेगा इज यू नो ऑल द काइंड ऑफ प्रॉब्लम दैट इट हैज बीन फेसिंग सो वन इज ऑफकोर्स द the fund shortage that uh, you know the 32% of the funding cut that uh, the scheme itself has seen but then she was talking about how well two things one is that there has been a push towards in the name of transparency is what uh, uh, richa was saying that is that there has been a, a, it's it's become increasingly bureaucratized and there's an an, an increase in paperwork that makes it quite difficult for uh, for it to be smoothly operated in in uh, the district and the second point is the whole push towards uh, digitalization so she mentioned a couple of um, uh, particular formats that uh, the narega has taken one of which is the aadhar based payment system where uh, there is um, aadhar card is and uh, it's a unique identification biometric card that every citizen of india has to have every resident of india has to have and uh, uh, so she was talking about how the move towards trying to link payment of these rural wages uh, with the identification of these cards has led to massive failures of payments reaching on time when the jobs actually do surface um, and the second uh, digital intervention that she spoke about was uh, the national the, mobile monitoring. the national monitoring mobile system what do you want yeah i can talk about that yeah. So the what they said is that you have to have an app on your phone which will record your attendance. But so that firstly, lots of these labels do not even have mobile phones. They never have mobile labels in particular because there's maybe one phone per family, and that will usually be with the man. So, uh, but if they do also have a phone, then um, they are in fact I think uh, um, 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 yeah they 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 supposed supposed to upload a photo or something also as part of that attendance thing. but then sometimes the server is not working you're in this very rural area where there's no network so while they've done the work their attendance is not recorded and because of that then they, it's like they're not paid so uh, shall i talk about what she that one woman laborer was saying yeah so she said yeah, that this one woman laborer was telling her that why are these really highly educated engineers and and politicians you know with the bureaucrats Uh, why are they squeezing the life out of our labor by bringing in all this so-called digital stuff, which is just not, um, uh, you know, it's actually taking us, taking the work away from us. And um, uh, and so, what a scheme that was a lifeline for many of many many Indian laborers in in the rural areas is now getting the life sucked out of it. I think she mentioned about uh, they they did manage to get a relief for the second system. Uh, other base payment system until the yes, yes, of, you know, on the third uh, until this third years of June yes by struggle yeah. Okay. Yes. Actually, while we are remembering things, I also wanted to say that she mentioned something quite important about crop insurance not reaching uh, the farmers when the you know the crops have subsequently failed in two consecutive years. So that was the other thing she mentioned. Yes. Uh, this last point for whom I ki. पूरा कैसे चल रहा है उनका जीवन हम अगर इसको देखें इन सब के साथ फिर जो यूथ हैं उनके वो क्या कर रहे हैं वो वो पलायन कर रहे हैं वो बड़े शहरों को जा रहे हैं और वहां से वो क्यों जाते हैं बड़े शहर को हम समझे हमने जो समझा पिछले तीस साल में अपने इलाके से कि वो किसी बहन बेटी की की मतलब की शादी के लिए पैसे जुटाने के लिए जाते हैं घर में कोई बीमार पड़ा है बहुत लोन हो चुका है तो उस लोन को चुकाने के लिए या बहुत अपने रोजमर्रा के जीवन को चलाने के लिए या अपने बहुत कुछ छोटे शौक जिसका सबको अधिकार है कि मेरे पास एक मोबाइल हो जाए मेरे पास कुछ अच्छे कपड़े या मेरे पास एक बाइक हो जाए तो ये एक पूरा एक स्ट्रगल चल रहा है लोग अपने इलाके और फिर दूसरी जगह आना जा रहे हैं 
और कुछ अर्न करके वापस आते हैं आफ्टर कोविड नाइनटीन स्थितियां और खराब हो चुकी हैं जो छोटे छोटे कारखाने थे सीतापुर जैसी छोटी जगहों पर छोटी छोटी फैक्ट्रीज थी वो बहुत कुछ बंद हो चुके हैं और ऐसे हाल में वो पलायन और तेजी से बड़े शहरों की तरफ हो रहा है मैं ये कह सकती हूँ कि एक कंटिन्यूस स्ट्रगल है जीवन जीने का स्ट्रगल है सम्मान से जीवन जीने का स्ट्रगल है जो चल रहा है एक छोटे से और एग्जांपल को देते हुए कि जब 2004-6 के बीच में एसकेएमएस को हम लोग बना रहे थे या इसको बनाने के लिए सोच रहे थे तो हम जो दो तीन महिलाएं इसके लीडरशिप में तब आई थी उभर कर वो पहले 100% परसेंट विमेन ऑर्गेनाइजेशन थी और महिलाओं के साथ काम करती थी हम सब 2004 थाउजेंड फोर के बीच हमें तब तक हमें ये समझ में आया अच्छी तरह से कि अगर हम महिलाओं की स्थिति को बेहतर करना चाहते हैं तो हमें सिर्फ महिलाओं के साथ नहीं बल्कि फीमेल एंड मेल दोनों को साथ लेकर एक साथ मिलकर रोटी के लिए संघर्ष करना होगा अगर एक रोटी का संघर्ष है तो महिला साथियों को को इसके लिए तैयार होना है कि हमें पूरी रोटी के लिए स्ट्रगल करना है साथ में उस रोटी में अपने पार्टिसिपेशन यानी आधी रोटी के लिए भी हमें लगातार अपने अपनों के बीच में ही अपना स्ट्रगल करते रहना होगा इस समझ के साथ एसकेएमएस संगठन मींस बेस्ट फीमेल फ्रेंड हम जब इसको बना रहे थे तो हमें बहुत ये एक चैलेंज था हम सबके सामने कि जब हम मेल फीमेल दोनों के साथ काम होता है तो मैक्सिमम लीडरशिप जो लीडरशिप है वो मेल के हाथों में चला जाता है या वो ले लेते हैं ये हमें अंदाज था और आज इस बात को कहना चाहूंगी कि हम लगभग 200 हंड्रेड विलेजेस में हैं सीतापुर के हर एक विलेज में विमेन लीडर हैं डिस्ट्रिक्ट लेवल टू विलेज लेवल हम ये काम कर रहे हैं ठीक वैसे ही हम ये भी मानकर चल रहे हैं कि मजदूर साथियों की स्थिति बहुत कठिन है जीवन जीना ही मुश्किल हो रहा है खास तौर से और पिछले दस सालों में जो जो मतलब एक्सप्रेशन का जो फ्रीडम था उस पर जिस तरह से कंट्रोल हुआ है तो हमारे लिए स्ट्रगल करना भी मुश्किल हो रहा है बावजूद इसके ये पूरा देश पूरी दुनिया जानती है कि इस देश को इस दुनिया को बनाने में मजदूरों का बड़ा रोल है और वो अपना स्ट्रगल करते हुए अपने जीवन को भी ऐसे ही जीते रहेंगे और निश्चित ही एक बेहतर दुनिया की ओर आगे बढ़ेंगे थैंक्स शुक्रिया टीचर जी आप वीडियो ऑन कर सकती हैं अब अगर आप आपको अगर सुविधा हो तो हाँ थैंक यू तो मैं लास्ट लोतिक और हम मिलके ट्रांसलेट करेंगे आपकी लास्ट पॉइंट को अब बेसिकली यू नो शी वाज टॉकिंग अबाउट हर लास्ट पॉइंट स्टार्टेड विद द क्वेश्चन एस टू व्हाई डू वर्कर्स एंड लैंड लैंडर्स दैट शी वर्क्स विद व्हाई डू द इंडिविजुअल्स ट्रेवल टू सिटीज एंड वॉट इट इज दैट constantly fuels this um, this migration the circular movement between the uh, between the villages and the cities um and she was talking about how um you know it, it is part of their everyday struggle for uh, livelihoods but it is also part of uh, having uh, having the desire to meet certain aspiration uh, and that aspiration is as something as little as wanting to own a mobile which is uh, frankly their right to be able to do that today in india in you know 2023 uh, 
um and uh, she was talking about how basically she has seen uh, this struggle become more intense since the 1990s uh, there used to be small factories uh, perhaps small enterprises in sitapur districts that she has seen shut down uh, over the last few decades um and uh, and 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 part of this this sort of uh, the, the change in the the local economy that has uh, made the struggles to keep these livelihoods together even more intense uh, made them start uh, skms uh, in 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 uh, and when they started skms uh, even in the early 2000s they were a group organization of uh, women it was a women only organization they were 100% women members but by 2004 2006 what they realized is that if they wanted the women to struggle and demand better livelihoods part of that struggle had to be involving uh, men in the group as well and it was men and women women together who could um, who would struggle for their uh, roti uh, bread as she said um, and uh, it was it was it was together that they could have a more successful struggle to demand uh, everything from jobs but uh, but also their rightful share through uh, agriculture uh they work in about 200 villages uh in in sitapur district and um and uh, their uh, worker friends on behalf of whom they struggle uh, richas organization struggles and and all the members who struggle uh, they found it particularly hard in the last uh, few years where freedom of expression is being curtailed uh, you know it has been um, it is it, it has been hard to carry on with the movement with the struggles given uh, the the repression uh, that that we see today uh, in in terms of uh, of freedom of expression but also just in terms of activism and being able to voice uh, people's struggles so if i missed out anything you'll be happy i'll pick on a few points i, I just um, wanted to also add to the reasons for uh, you know the displacement of people into towns is um the medical expenses i mean really the public health system in india has crumbled so badly that yeah if a person falls ill in these families that can that can really upset whatever daily life was just being managed to live with the bill hospital bills and things that that come up if they managed to get get to a hospital so that's certainly a really you know, i i felt it was a really important yeah, point yeah. that we uh, that richa had mentioned the other the the yeah the all this uh, there was a lot of small businesses and all yet in sitapur and Uh, as as uh, as um, uh, you, you said, they they were closing over the years, but COVID nineteen really, uh, as uh, as Vicha mentioned, also when there was a sudden closure, that really hit hit all these uh, uh, enterprises, and because of that, local employment is again uh, you know gone down, and that has not really come up again uh, after COVID nineteen. Uh, and then um, yeah we uh, when when they started bringing um, men into the into the sangham they mentioned that they noticed that you know there is a tendency for men to take over the leadership and they were very conscious that that should happen and in all the 200 uh, villages it's all women leaders that they have uh, and um, and just at the end yes said but whatever it is the whole world knows and the country knows that it is it is these laborers yes who have built the country up and who's who will continue to struggle for themselves and the country in in the future thank you so much thank you rita ji aap um mujhe malum hai aapko jana hai to agar aap aur agar 20 30 minutes agar aap aadhi ghanta ruk sakti hain to bahut या अगर आपको जाना है तो प्लीज आप आप जा भी सकती है बट अगर आप और आधी घंटा रुक सकती है तो हो सकता है कुछ क्वेश्चंस होंगे ऑडियंस से पर सबास्टियन से पहले आ, हम लोग उनकी भी बात से पहले सुनना चाहते हैं जी आपकी आवाज हमको सुना नहीं दे रही आपने म्यूट किया अपने को हेलो मैं रुकती हूँ बस इतना ही अच्छा शुक्रिया थैंक यू um, Okay, so next we have uh, another uh, excellent speaker, Sebastian Lakra. He's a Jesuit anthropologist. Uh, he's assistant director and head of Migrant Labor Solidarity Center, uh, Bagicha Ranchi. He holds a PhD from Sambalpur University in Odisha, and uh, his dissertation examined indigenous knowledge knowledge systems among the Bagas in uh, Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh. 
He has previously taught at Xavier Institute of uh, Development uh, Action and Studies in Jabalpur in West Bengal. Uh, Sebastian, it is such a pleasure to have you. Uh, over to you. Thanks, Lotika. And Johar to everyone. Johar. Johar. Am I audible? Yes. Yes, you are. Okay. Uh, this is Sebastian Lakra working in Migrant Labor Solidarity Center. We have named uh, this particular um, department or particular work as Migrant Labor Solidarity Center. And uh, this migration issues can be understood, particularly in Central Indian states. These are Chhattisgarh, Orissa, Jharkhand, Madhya Pradesh, and some part of uh, West Bengal, Bihar also, as UP already we have uh, heard from Richa, Rajasthan and Gujarat. So these yeah. are particularly yeah, we are focusing on, yeah, yeah, particularly we are focusing on Chhattisgarh, Odisha, and Jharkhand. And in these, the three types of migra migrations can be understood. The first is migration of young Adivasi women to urban centers, whom we call or who uh, they are known as uh, domestic working women. And they are particularly uh, all go to towns and uh, uh, urban centers, metropolitan cities, and all that. Actually, this trend has began in 1970s. At that time, it was very small in number, but now in all the metropolitan cities, it is a huge number. Uh, we do not have the exact uh, uh, statistics about them. Some studies have been made, but then I'm not very sure about uh, uh, the exact uh, statistics about them. Why the, re the regions of these young women and uh, girls go to uh, cities? Because at home, actually these are some, some are dropouts and some are illiterate women as well. But at home, there is nothing very specific which they can do profitable and meaningful way or economic activities in the off agricultural season or in other times also. So basically these states, these central Indian states are rain, rain fed agriculture and single crop harvest that is paddy cultivation and some grains on the upland they have, but only one crop. There is rain fed agriculture and after that there is nothing much to earn or have some livelihood options. So these young women to support themselves and for their families they go out and uh, we know uh, there it is a, a new culture, they are completely unaware of the city life. Their employers, they do not know. The, the nature of the work, they are unaware. The terms and conditions of their work, the remuneration or wages, the living conditions, everything almost they are unaware and they land up there in the metropolitan cities. Some, they never come back or we find they, there are lost cases or mysterious deaths and some also uh, we find that uh, uh, it is trafficked or sold to uh, brothels some forcibly married to elderly men in the workplace or in that uh, situation and those who are lucky to come back home face social boycott by the villagers and getting married and uh, settling down becomes a difficult uh, situation for them. Therefore, many they like to remain in the cities and uh, they do not come back. 
The second is migration of entire families. And these are, again, it is on the off agricultural season. This happens uh, when they go to brick killings, particularly these people or these families, they go to brick killings into UP, to Bihar, and now also they go to southern states. And also some go to uh, uh, construction sites and many other manual laborers site they go. They, they go between December to June each year and come back before the uh, agriculture work begins. The government ignores this seasonal migration or migrant workers. It does not take notice of it. People go and come, and that is how they support their families and they, they have their. Some there are also because of uh, displacement, there are mining and industrialization and uh, agricultural work. It has not been developed. Irrigation facilities have not been developed and therefore uh, there is no uh, sustainable uh, support systems in the off-season agriculture. So they migrate and come back. This is the second type of. The third type of migration is of Adivasis or Dalit youth to southern states. And we find now it is hundreds of thousands go to southern states like Karnataka, Kerala, Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, all these states. Now also to the western states, Maharashtra, Gujarat, and other places as well. These, these workers are taken by contractors or middlemen. And before COVID-19 lockdown, Kerala had already, as we heard from the uh, previous speaker, there, there, there are huge numbers. At that time, it was some estimation, 35 lakhs or 3.5 million workers in Kerala. And in Tamil Nadu, it was 1 million workers at that time. But while during the COVID-19 lockdown, it was estimated by our respective states and seven, almost more than seven lakh migrant workers from Jharkhand. They were stranded or they were, they were estimated or they were known at that time. And 10 lakhs plus or 10 lakhs 7,000 from Odisha and 10 lakhs and 80, uh, 85,000 from Chhattisgarh. Similarly, it is of Madhya Pradesh, Bihar, West Bengal, and other states as well. Now, these are mostly of these three states. These are migrant workers belong to marginal communities, tribals, Dalits, and OBCs. Reasons, again, it is deepening poverty because uh, the land or the agricultural development has not taken sufficiently, though there have been a lot of tribal uh, sub plans, tribal development schemes and projects, but uh, it has not taken uh, sufficiently and uh, people are struggling. And the other issue as uh, Manrega, which, have, which could have been the lifeline of the workers, but that is also a failure. They do not get uh, their wages in time and low wages and so many other uh, technical formalities are to be done and it delays. It gets delayed and people do not get uh, uh, their support system. Therefore, they migrate. Now, this uh, Migrant Labor Solidarity Center, how these migrant workers or uh, have uh, we conducted one study and uh, we saw that uh, in these three states we had taken Chhattisgarh, uh, from Chhattisgarh seven uh, districts, Jharkhand ten districts and Odisha 
six districts and altogether it was 23 districts 48 blocks that is uh, uh, we have one unit after uh, a district has several blocks panchayats under the blocks there are panchayats and we have uh, 102 panchayats we covered and villages about 157 villages and uh, the returning migrant workers we interviewed it was 1534 so what it speaks uh, the gender distribution of the migrant workers in this particular uh, those people those who migrate the youth particularly and uh, seasonal migrations and in these uh, interstate migrant workers so the gender distribution is about 87 percent is of male and only about 12 percent is of female so uh, majority are the male uh, migrant workers social categories when we see then it is about st is 71 percent and SC is about 16% and OBC is 12% and general category it is about 1%. So huge it is as I had been saying that these central uh, Indian states, particularly Chhattisgarh, Odisha, Jharkhand, also Madhya Pradesh and these states are heavily populated by STs and uh, the migrant workers as well form a very high percentage of this category. The age distribution when we see, what is the age distribution? About 21 to 30 years or uh, 20 years or below it is about 17% uh, migrant workers. Actually, they should be in the schools or they should have been uh, the dropouts and uh, gone for migra migration or actually they should be in the schools and uh, that is why it is a uh, uh, we say we say that uh, this uh, group should not uh, be a migrant worker year between years 21 to 30 it is about 40 years uh, 48 percent 31 to 40 years, it is about 22%. 41 to 50 years, it is about 9% and so on. So when we see it is between age group, 21 to 40 years, it is again added, it, it makes about 70% is a young and uh, healthy workforce that goes out of our states or of our uh, places uh, as migrant workers. Educational backgrounds, they, have, they are not much educated, but uh, certainly they are uh, somewhat uh, middle school or um, uh, uh, little higher uh, secondary schools they have uh, undergone, but not much and therefore they are uh, very uh, vulnerable as well. Usually, the data shows that uh, they go to southern states. It is our studies also confirm that 35% uh, uh, they, they prefer to go to southern states and to western states it is about 26%. Nature of work, it is more or less unskilled workers on construction sites, on road uh, constructions and uh, agricultural work and other places. So manual laborers, these are more uh, about, they are about 62% are unskilled workers. Wage payment, it is very less percentage is given as uh, or through uh, through bank transfer or check payments but it is about 60 percent people or migrant workers are paid uh, cash on hand or some other means but 
cash payment is there. Here is the problem. We find that many our migrant workers, they are cheated in course of payment uh, in cash, some uh, uh, percentage of uh, commissions, the contractors they take away, and uh, there are cheatings and uh, other practices are also involved. And uh, we want that this uh, wage payment should be ensured into or through the bank uh, uh, transactions. Now, another issue we try to understand the migrant workers and their economy at, in the village, those migrant workers who had returned and we conducted about 6,244 households of these returning migrants. And that shows that uh, again, it is 72% is of the ST, that is the tribals, uh, indigenous groups. And SC, it is about 16%. OBC, it is about 9%. General, it is about less than 1%. So this is the, in the village scenario also, it is uh, majority are the indigenous groups. Land holding pattern, as many in UP we found it is landless persons, but it is here in these uh, central Indian states, we find there are land holders. At least some land they are holding and uh, our study shows that it is about 88% are land holding households. Now, how much they uh, hold the land that is uh, in the, uh, uh, we can, uh, we have also studied that and it is about 65% are the marginal farmers. That is less than five acres of land. And even less than one acre, it is about 43% people are having less than 43% or almost it is about 44% and marginal worker, marginal farmers are, are 65%. Small farmers are only 11% uh, and semi-middle farmers are uh, about 4% and middle farmers are 2% and big farmers are less than 1%. So again, the issue is here, the migrant workers, those fall under the category of marginal farmers or small farmers. Their agricultural pattern is of uh, rain fed agriculture it is about all 85 uh, percent uh, respondents have said that it is rain fed agriculture there is no irrigation facility or irrigation facility in these areas is about one uh, about one percent the food sufficiency period of food sufficiency of the households and uh, less uh, less than six for food sufficiency, less than six months or approximate to six months, it is about 33%. And less than 12 months, it is about 21%. And more than one year, it is about 7.7% 7 .7 people are having food sufficiency. So again, it is food insufficiency is uh, faced by the majority of the migrant workers. Now these people go to different locations to southern states and other places and they are vulnerable because they do not know the language. It is a language bar barrier there and therefore they have to manage, uh, depend on the others and they are simple people, they are cheap laborers, and they have to abide whatever is uh, they, are, they find job outside there. There are, they face exclusion because of uh, the labor rights, labor unions, uh, political rights, even 
shelters and uh, the other benefits all these they they are excluded and they do not get uh, the uh, uh, benefits of the workers rights there are also fears last time you must have heard about there were rumors or there were uh, situations that in southern india the migrant workers uh, uh, were threatened to their life and it is a uh, situation of xenophobia and people were afraid and uh, there were chaotic situations and people uh, the migrant workers of up bihar and uh, of the northern states they tried to come back because of the rumors fear and all that so these situations arise time to time and the local workers they are no they are very hostile or rather hostile to the migrant workers because they are uh, curtailed of their works by these uh, migrant workers because they compromise with the lesser rate or the low rate wages and that also they try and the bargaining power what they uh, the local migrant uh, the local workers they try to get that that is uh, curtailed they feel health hazards and accidents and deaths there are many cases these days we are uh, uh, receiving every day almost some cases we have whatsapp groups and we are trying to work uh, all over india and uh, uh, every day we get some cases of accidents of deaths and uh, uh, other situations there are many situations any number of situations we have sebastian i'm really sorry to cut you short but um, uh, yeah. If you could wrap up in next two minutes, then we'll take question and answer, and we'll carry on the very important discussion that we, uh, you know, you have started. Okay. Thank so you. we have uh, established what for oh, seeing these all situations. We have established a main helpline, and uh, this uh, this is working. We call it migrant assistance and information network, and it is working into fourteen states in southern. and also in the central states uh, we are trying to address all the situations which are uh, in our uh, informations we what whatever reaches and we are trying to reach it, uh, reach out and helping them out uh, at the last maybe i'd like to summarize that uh, we have three approaches one is accompanying the migrant workers in this test situations through this helpline models and we try to reach out whoever calls us or whoever whoever is in difficulty and approach with this number or any whatsapp group number we try to reach them out and help them out and it is strange it is very amazing that within 24 hours less than 24 hours we are able to solve the situations many of the cases second we want to make it as a safe migration that is uh, registration of the migrant workers uh, skill development of the migrant workers and uh, in that line we try to uh, go forward and third uh, unless as i said all these migrant workers have land in some proportion or some uh, uh uh some something they have and therefore something could be done on a sustainable development or sustainable source of livelihood options uh, could be developed and uh, to somewhat there could be a mitigation of migration of distress migration this is the approach we have taken up and uh, we, we try to do as far as possible that uh, Uh, this helpline is helping in uh, to accompany and uh, addressing the current, uh, the uh, distress situations and the other issues we are still uh, going on and we are working on it slowly so thank you for uh, listening me patiently thank you so much um, i think we'll now just move on to discussion and questions um, we'll also ask those who are online 
to uh, you know raise your hand or put in a comment or a discussion point in the chat um richa ji has unfortunately had to go uh, she did tell us that she'd have to leave so um sadly we won't have her participation but we can take the questions to her or have her back in the conversation so floor is open Okay. Also, if you could introduce yourself, please. Okay. That would be uh, good. Thanks. My name is Martin Thomas from Wilkins oh, Gillespie. Okay. Um, if I recall right, um, Marion Wallerstein discusses um, the labour market in South Korea in the early years of industrialization and says it's not really a labour market because um, the works in the cities are mostly young. Uh, workers from villages and depend um, for their upkeep as much on the villages as on their wages. Wages are extra. So, um, but then we see over decades that South Korea has become urbanized. There are trade unions, wages are much higher. So, so that, that um, you've got, you had situations similar to India, which has been changed by economic evolution. Um, in Brazil, under the first Lula government, as I understand it, the number of formal workers was increased very dramatically. And that not really as a result of economic evolution, well, not a result of current economic evolution, so a period of deindustrialization in Brazil. As a result of political changes, a lot more, more workers become formal. So neither of those things seems to be happening in India. Can we see any pointers from those two other experiences that how things might be changed in India or might change? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm, if you want me to, to respond yeah. to that, I'll really happily do so. Thanks. Now, I mean, it's a very good question because, of course, uh, classically, certainly I had that model in my head that the South would follow the West. Uh, sooner or later, uh, industrialization would take place, and uh, it might be hard and uh, terrible for the people that had to go through it. But one day, they would reach a, a social democratic solution. Now, I think there's absolutely no reason to believe that that is what is taking place in, in countries like India. There is uh, no evidence that the increased uh, productivity, that the increased output, leads to a change in employment of the kind that we have seen in the global north. So I think that belonged to a different era, sadly, or to a country like uh, China, that is uh, the, the, the factory of the world. There might be the odd country that, that can become the factory of the world, but the whole world cannot become the factory of the world. Uh, India tries, uh, but it, it does so without actually increasing employment. Uh, so, uh, and without, uh, and, and because of that, Partly because of that, and partly because of its ex extremely repressive regime, it also maintains labor conditions that are frankly appalling. So, to me, the the that model, that thinking, that uh, the global south will become like us, industrialization will happen sooner or later, will lead to better conditions. There's no evidence that that is happening. Say, manufacturing in India has since the 1980s employed between 10 and, and, and 12 percent. The area where there has been growth outside of, there has been a fall in the employment within agriculture, but the area where the growth in employment has been, has been in service and construction, not in the so-called productive sectors. So you, you can have economic growth, you can have enormous profits without that actually leading to, to any employment change for the population. And that is what's happening in India and in and and to uh, and to say well that one day will change because that is what happened in in France so in, I think that's just dreaming I mean it could be I mean I'm not saying you, you of course you can have policies that can need to need to change but the markets will not carry that change by itself yeah well, we are talking, in Brazil it's policies yes. in South Korea it's economic development yeah. either you know both yeah. of these are not in the north. Uh, and uh, was it also a lot of military and, and I'm very happy to, to yeah. and China is, is, is another case in point. But there is a, a, a South Korea happens before New Zealand. Uh, and, and, and there's a big, big change when you have 
financial markets, when you have capital moving to wherever it makes most sense for capital to make quick profits here and now, it puts competitive pressures on, on, on the way production is organized uh, that leads to labor saving, uh, making, uh, 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 ways of doing productivity or production that, that means that the old ideas of what markets just did, uh, in my view, uh, are, are just not valid anymore. Basically, of course you can change. If, if you dare to step out of WTO, if you dare to, to, to run an independent policy, of course there are major things you can do, in particular such a big country as India. But it's not something you can do if you stick to the globalization strategy that all governments in India for the last 30 years at least have run. In the context of industrialization, if I may add, to, of Brazil in particular, was also certain kinds of industries that were a lot more labor intensive than the kind of industrialization in the, you know, in, in the in the early 1980s and 1990s that India saw. So it moved to the service industry that fueled its economic growth uh, much more than the manufacturing and the kind that you're talking about that then subsequently led to the industrialization in Brazil. So I just think that there are quite different paths um, of, uh, of jobs. But I think we have a question there, and then perhaps we can bring Sebastian and uh, and we can see if there are questions online. So you have a question first. Um, I understand. Um, I apologize if it's quite an obvious question, but um, if there was more GDP, where is this money going? It's not going back into the ring. That was to if the online people yeah. heard you. <laughs> can people online hear the questions? And the discussions? Uh, uh, Sebastian, could you hear the question? Uh, yes. We, oh, we have a yes. Okay, okay great. Um, so I think we'll, uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll collect on the question and we'll have that question about where the income is going. Uh, and we'll also get Sebastian uh, to discuss that. Go ahead. What's your question? So you, uh, uh, my name is Bhupendra. I'm a, a master's student here at Xbox. Um, so uh, I have two questions. Uh, so first question is uh, that while the economic and climate changes are forcing the laboring masses in India, mostly Dalits and tribal, to migrate to the city, becoming as footloose and like precarious labor, I was just wondering like how the rural elites uh, at the same time are able to maintain their privileges and reproduce uh, the caste class of uh, like, uh, uh, the structures of power. Uh, and uh, second question was to Dethikaji, um, uh, uh, because like uh, she is more emphasizing on Manrega, but she is not talking about the PDS, which is also a kind of guarantee uh, act to the food. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, we have seen how the uh, current right wing government has been uh, uh, pitching this scheme as a populist scheme at the time of election, at least uh, uh, state uh, assembly elections. So, like how you are, uh, like how she is trying to looking this this struggle for voting or trade because like there's a regime who is like playing on to the populist uh, right wing policies, and at the same time, uh, like from the left perspective. If it is mere a kind of uh, fight for uh, uh, material good or bread as such, then where is the question for dignity? Because in a way, migration is also kind of moral protest for Dalits because they are being suppressed into, into, into the larger rural structures and they want to escape sometimes. And not necessarily that this is always the economic conditions putting them always on, on, onto these decisions. So I would appreciate uh, Two sports. excellent yeah. questions. Thank you. Um, I, did I see a hand that side? Yeah, Nick. <clears throat> I, I don't know whether I, there are several questions I have, but I don't know whether I should say any more or not. Um, first question is really perhaps Dan can let this go. Is that you know the, the, the big workers are part of the migration labor force. And they are actually now, they are no longer actually workers, they're actually bonded laborers. And 
they actually uh, have to take a loan out, you know, before they go to work and then they pay off that loan whilst they're working. And that actually bonds them into that, that labor force. And this is, this is a very acute problem uh, affecting probably over a million, maybe two million workers. And, and, and what respite do they have? What, what workers' organizations uh, in, 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 the, in the formal sector uh, can, can they rely upon? That, that was one question. I have a question for Sebastian. And, and that is, you know, having visited Jharkhand, there's miles and miles and miles of land, which is agricultural land. And workers are having to migrate uh, on seasonal basis because there's no, they, they'll stay there whilst there's rain. When the rain season is gone, they have to, go there, they have to migrate. Why is there never been uh, an irrigation system set up? Uh, that does baffle me. Whereas if you go to Punjab, there are canals all over the place. They're in Tri, and there are canals all over the place. Why is that situation? Okay, sorry. So I'm going to, yeah, um, check, go ahead. No, I, I, I just have a, a corollary question because they were all speaking about conflict labor and uh, in the discussion also. Uh, what was emphasized upon was that uh, most of these uh, laborers that we are talking about, unskilled laborers, uh, laborers in the unorganized sector, most of them belong to uh, the Dalit and the Adivasi communities. Uh, but what I have noticed over the years is that, um, and like uh, 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 it was mentioned that some of them, when they migrate in the cities uh, uh, for the opportunities, they still get stuck as exploited labor. So on, on one hand, we are talking about that how industrialization is sucking up uh, the jobs, but there is no end to the exploitation of these laborers, regardless of where they uh, migrate to or whether they remain in the rural structure. So then what effort are being made towards uh, protection of these laborers from such exploitation? Because we, we see that there is only one law currently in place, which is your bonded labor system abolition act, which is not implemented at all. And uh, the subsequent one, because the Bonded Labor System Abolition Act is a very, um, it's caste neutral kind of act where it incorporates caste and also it emphasizes on debt bondage. But then Prevention of Atrocities Act specifically says that if a SC or an SC is found to be in bondage under the upper caste, uh, uh, under the dominant group uh, communities, then that act needs to be enforced. But we don't see that happening. So. Uh, why we are talking about the protection as in uh, uh, skill development of the migrant workers when they migrate to other places and, and especially post COVID-19 people were talking, uh, the government was talking about enhancement of social security measures. What nobody was talking about was that, uh, yes, there is theft of wages, but nobody was talking about was the bondage that these people were suddenly released from because there was no work and 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 the employers were probably wanted to let them go because they wanted to take part themselves. So why isn't the government and why isn't the organizations working in these areas talking about the protection of workers through law enforcement? Thank you. Um you partly answered your question, but yeah, it's a very important question. So what I'll do is that we'll ask your question. Um, so we'll start with the last question, Sebastian, if that's all right. If you could address uh, the question about the, uh, you know, the persistence of exploitation uh, amongst uh, uh, migrant laborers, but also, you know, the, uh, the issue of bonded labor and how, why, why that's not being addressed by the laws that we have. And also address the PDS question, uh, you know, to what extent it's working in the areas that you're working and how important you think that is. And then we'll go to Jens and then we'll come back to you, Sebastian, if that's all right. Sebastian, I don't know if you could hear me. I'm here. And now, uh, the bonded laborers and brick kiln workers. And this is, uh, of course, a very sad phenomenon and uh, no labor 
uh, law also takes uh, interest on these and uh, we have not been able to do that. Last time we had about 167 uh, bond, like bonded laborers in brick in Andhra Pradesh, which we tried to rescue and also to claim for their remuneration. Two groups we had and we did it. And uh, similarly, there are many groups and many uh, on these issues, the communists, they go out. We are uh, unable to do on these because we do not have the uh, workers associations and usually because of uh, uh, association which could fight on behalf of them and uh, support uh, these workers. But because of the poverty and because of the scarcity of their financial resources, I said, they take loans early in advance loan they take and they are trapped into bonded laborers. So this is the situation we find and we are unable to do it much. But uh, slowly our uh, group uh, team members and NGOs like minded people, they are coming forward and we are trying to do it. The second is uh, the land in Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh or Odisha, there are extensive lands. Barrel lands almost we have uh, uh, after the rainy season. And these are usually the tribal people, they are re re uh, residing in the uphill areas, which is uh, uh, though the surface water or the ground water, or the water table is quite high, but uh, we are not able to do. The government has not done much on the irrigation systems. The mega Dams or the mega projects, dam and irrigation systems, irrigations less, but for the industrializations. Now, uh, Hirakun Dam, you may remember in Urisa, and the from these dams earlier it was meant for the irrigation of the agriculture, but majority or now it is the high percent of water is uh, consumed by the factories and the industrializations and the. Agricultural uh, people, families are not getting water. These system, these things are there. So we expected from the government uh, the systems irrigation system should have been in place, but it is not. And therefore, in climatic change situations like this, what we could do is these our tribal people. These uh, uh, they have their uh, default or rather organic agriculture in default and therefore this could be one area which could be developed and we think that we will be able to uh, go in this and if I could uh, uh, did I answer your questions partly or somewhat Yes, uh, uh, you, you answered a couple of them could you also sh uh, tell us a little bit about PDS there was a question on the PDS uh, PDS also we have uh, another uh, partner that is what we call is Lokmanj partner and it is about uh, in India it is 14 states and 92 partners are working on it and uh, uh, we are trying it but uh, uh, the situation is uh, the underpayment or uh, less payment uh, less uh, 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 rice or uh, grains given to the uh, families. All these happens and PDA systems are also not very effective, though the systems are in place, but uh, the practices are bit, uh, not very encouraging and it is not timely. They take a bribe, they, they have uh, commissions and all those systems are there. So. Uh, people find difficult in this system to benefit as well. Okay, thanks. Um, I I think yes. Uh, perhaps you also want to start with the, the very important question on bonded labor, and then yes. as many as you want to answer. Mm -hmm. So thanks, um, and and so interesting, Sebastian, to hear your presentation and the and the knowledge from what's actually going on on the ground and your assessments. 
and and of course your organization is one of the organizations that do fantastic work there it's not there are others as well and to start with the question of so what could be done and that, i think that is where the 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 agency lies today. It is with activist organizations on the ground that are organizing bonded laborers, that are organizing brick kiln workers, taken organizations such as the Center for Labor Research and, 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 and Activism in, 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 the, in Ahmedabad that have had 20 years of success in organizing uh, 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 brick kiln workers with increased or improved labor conditions and increased wages as a, as a, as a consequence. Um, and now our organizing sugarcane workers with equal success, all, all informalized labor. So it's possible. And they, by the way, use the uh, 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 Caste Atrocity Prevention Act and the Bonded Labor Act to threaten employers. Well, if you're not giving them the wages we're asking for, we will drag them to court. So, so while these legislations are toothless, because they're not employed, they're not used by governments, they can be, be quite effective when activist organizations make use of them. So, I mean, that is where the, 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 the agency lies, as far as I've been seeing. Um, I, I, I personally, uh, I'm amongst those that, that hesitate a bit with the label bonded labor. Uh, I think there's a huge sort of span of laborers in India that take out loans before they start a job, construct in, 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 in the work uh, that I've been in charge of, done on construction labors and garment workers in, in, uh, in, in Delhi, they also take out loan before they start. Um, and so it says they're bonded, uh, but they certainly do not consider themselves bonded. They, they do it because they need the money before they go and do it. And for and over the first two, three months, they pay back the loans. And, and we showed how, in the end, most, even of the construction workers, would go back to the village in the end with an amount of money. Not a lot, but an amount of money. So, uh, so bondage is very often only for a season, and it's very often only for part of the season. The real difficulty for many workers is that they're not paid till the end of the season. So, so in that sense, they're tied in to the to the to the employer because, of course, they don't want to leave before they're paid. Uh, so, 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 so that ties. But to say that it's slavery and bondage to me, it's often over the top. Not always. There are particular with Dalit or with Adivasi's cases where it actually is close to slavery. But to say that all Brickham workers are bonded and slaves to me doesn't help us understand the agency that those workers actually have when they're given a chance. So, so there, there are sort of discussions to be had there as well. Just as another point, it's interesting as well that none of us have mentioned gig workers, and there's a reason for that. It's because to become a gig worker, you, you need a bit of capital or you need a bit of connection. These, these jobs we're talking about are people with no money, with no connections. And the kind of jobs you can get are the rock bottom job. And gig worker is actually not a rock bottom job. It's not a good job, so it's not rock, rock bottom either. So, so, so in a hierarchy, there, there, there are different things one should think about in relation to workers and, and who we who speaks to our our uh, our senses. The gig worker speaks to our sense, but it's, they, they may not be the lowest caste and, and, the, and the worst of people. Um, so these are just sort of scattered comments around labor in, in relation to this. By the way, it also means uh, someone asks who the formal sector organizations that would work with bonded laborers. If they don't, formal, formal unions work mainly with the members of those formal unions, and they are formally employed laborers that are very far removed from bonded labor. And um, so that is, but they might have some outreach, but that's not what they do. That they protect their own labors primarily and they do so. It's important that they do so, it's progressive that they do so, but it means they normally do not do a lot for, for those that are at the rock bottom. So and there were a quick couple of questions of where did the money go? I mean, uh, to uh, firstly, um, uh, as always in commodity chains, they go up the chains to the, I mean, the, the, the factories in India are being squeezed by the global north. Uh, it is also well known that uh, I mean, if you go to Mumbai and see the gold pedestals in the air, if you see the Adanis and the Ambanis, the amount of money they have amassed, if you 
read about the amount of money that is black money that is available for elections in India, you can see another place where this money go. If you look at the inequality figures, you can see how they go up to the very top. And so but the, I mean, that is just a sort of crude way of putting it. And I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if, if Sebastian can talk much more about to where the money goes in the local area from the parts where I work in, in Bangladesh. I, I, I can see how the local landed elites, uh, uh, some of them have been very good at buying into the big money that I'm talking about here uh, through investing outside of agriculture, often in dubious transactions in construction, for example, making big money. Uh, uh, others that were the old landed elites that I've seen mainly in the West European charts, they have done quite well, but not become mega, mega multinaires, uh, multi millionaires, just doing very well, thank you, way above what the land and the labor they themselves should, should, should justify, but not at that mega level. And they invest in education, they invest in connections, and they, if they are capital, they invest it in inventions and it pays off for many of them, of course, not for all their winners and losers, as always. Um, so um, so I think that's that's that for me for now, but just trying to, to sketch some some answers and that we no doubt can be disputed. Yeah, I would say it's some of the money goes in real estate as well. But um, um, we had a question about your question. I haven't forgotten that about, you know, how does, if there's so much migration and if there is this kind of exploitation, then how, what kind of legitimacy there, does the rural elite have to have power? Um, we will, I think we'll touch on that question. Let's just collect another round of questions and we'll come back to yours and then we'll pose that to Sebastian. Can you say Sasha, you come in one you know. Uh, what you said about young know, about the uh, yeah the, in, the formal labor unions and organizations do not represent or uh, do the un un uh, un the informal labor isn't it it's about just seven percent really which is the formal labor and where the formal unions are working with it's only seven percent rest are all, all actually outside that system so that we are talking of very minor small minority when we come. Right. Which then, of course, poses the question of unionization in India, and perhaps we'll take that yeah, in one of the yeah. series. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, Sasha had a question. Lake have, has a question. You have a question. So, Sasha, did you want to start? Yeah, absolutely. Here? So, I've got just one question. I'll actually questions and then um, I should say a few things about India Labour solidarity because and what we're doing is like a sort of with the organization. So, my first question is to Jens, which is, um, was the was the percentage of formal workers in the economy ever higher than it is now? And when did it peak? If so, um, when did it peak and start to decline? Um, my other question I know the answer to, but I thought it might be worth someone just clarifying the references to the scheduled tribes, scheduled to pass, and other bank pass, what that refers to. Um, because not everyone in the audience will know that. So I just want to say about Indian labor solidarity. So um we're organising this educational event and this educational series, um, but we're not just, um, and I don't mean this in a dismissive way, we're not just an academic organisation, it's an activist in this issue. So we were set up um, last year um, when, because we, um, some of us have been involved in organising um, solidarity with um, some workers' organisations in India, and we realised there's a problem, which is that the, uh, the labour movement and the left and progressive people in general in the UK, certainly who are not from an Indian or South Asian background, don't pay any attention to India really at all, despite all the obvious reasons why it would be necessary to do so, like historical connections, public connections, um, solidarity, and also actually self interest and religion other things. So we, we set ourselves a project to find to start to raise awareness and generate those links between workers' organisations in India and workers' organisations in Britain. Um, and start to organise um, common uh, common things and solidarity. So we had um, we undertook our first activities at um, the Trade Union Congress and Labour Party conferences last October, and then we had our founding meeting here in um, in December, where we had a number of um, so we had some some people like Nadi Kaur and Bill Khan who spoke, and also um, Nadi Wixon who did a left wing. Labour Party MP in the background, uh, and Maria Excellent from the Trade Union Congress. 
So um, we're working on a whole number of different initiatives um, to do with trying to generate a kind of awareness and solidarity and links. I mentioned so um, if you haven't left your details, please leave your details behind. There are lots of things to get involved in. And just to say, uh, after after we've had a break and some food and so on, we'll be sitting around to discuss organizing and work a bit more. So anyone who wants to say, please feel welcome. Just the last thing, sorry to go on for so long, is we have been raising money for organizations in India, not online for obvious reasons, but in meetings and through donations. So um, we are at the moment collecting money for Mazda um, Adhikar Sangathan, which is a something between a union and a worker centre in Haryana. Um, so at the end, if you'd like to make a donation, either, either a cash donation or have a card reader, it would be great if we could, you know, then tell them that we've made, you know, made a donation for this meeting. Thanks very much. Thank Sorry to come so long. Um, so we are conscious that we are over time, um, but shall we do a last round of questions? But we'll also be hanging around and having okay. the discussion. So just quick questions and then uh, we'll have to wrap it up, sadly. Yeah, Abby Rami, uh, part of Unite. Um, I was going to ask, and it's kind of sorry, I didn't get your name, Martin. Martin, I was kind of lost her point as well. Um, a lot of this is stemmed by the caste system, which kind of they do transfer those beliefs to like the Western world as well. Is there anything being done to get rid of that caste system or to like stop using those acronyms, <laughs> those terms? Because, yeah, we talk about labor rights, but it also affects like. The healthcare system, education system. So yeah, like just to break the stigma around the negative stigma around the caste system. Is there anything being done for that? Super. So I mean, I think also this was I was going to say Santosh. So this is this is not this is discussion. So we'll just have Santosh answer that question and then. Uh, um, so Santosh, shall we hang on? We'll just get another question and then you can uh, answer the question. Yeah. Um, yeah, my uh, my got a question about um I'm, I'm sorry, I'm Jay, I'm with a racially impressed caucus. Um I have a question about um they had um as we mentioned uh common land that's been encroached on. Is there any specific um legislation that allowed for that to happen? Any specific policies? Um I just if there is any like uh tangible uh, like actual dates or something that we can refer to as okay. Um Santosh, why don't you? I think um, I don't really feel very qualified to talk about the yeah. situation. Of course, there are laws there that are enforced, and we've kind of heard about all that. But um, but certainly, I think uh, you know we the the Labour Solidarity uh, Group have been working on a on our paper on the free trade agreement between India and the UK, and actually putting caste at the sort of issue centre centre stage, and I've been really, really encouraged by listening to Jens's uh, analysis, because I think that pretty much sums up a lot of the stuff that we need to bring to the forefront. So we do it, and uh, people like myself, you know, we have opportunities, you know, with, uh, you know, meeting people, uh, you know, you know, heads of parties or whatever, you know, we raise it, and I did that with Rahul Gandhi and, 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 and the Minister for... Um, yeah, from as well. So, so we're constantly doing it, you know, through this and through uh, discussions in Parliament here at the UK, in the UK Parliament, so that we can try and raise uh, the, the, you know, the, the whole atrocities around past human rights violations, but also the disparity between uh, between the, the various castes within the debate. You know, the, the Foreign Office can take back as issues as well to do with India. So uh, it, it, it's an issue uh, that has gone on for thousands of years, but I think a lot of us are being incredibly more vocal, people like Praveen and, and others, about it and raising it, you know, not only in the media, but, you know, through our Twitter reviews and stuff. But, but I think, you know, sort of us citizens here in this country, uh, you know, one of the things that we've also been trying to do is to actually get the law implemented on caste discrimination in this country. As well. Yeah. So interesting that you're a member of Unite because I do want to discuss, uh, you know, how the I'm unions can help them. us help us with, with, with doing that. It's fine because unions have a massive problem with racism. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And I, I think they, they so so I'm sorry, that probably isn't a 
sufficient answer. But, uh, no, that's that's excellent. And I think, um, you know, if you hang around and Lothika has just written uh, a wonderful uh, and insightful piece <laughs> about how um, caste okay. basically is per perpetuates within the garment sector in the UK. So, you know, mm -hmm. some of the norms that uh, that that discuss uh, that, that sort of structure the labor regime around caste in India also is reproduced here in the UK. So you can have a conversation with her. I know you had a question as well, but so I'll wait for you okay, yeah, perfect. No, um, there's nothing online, but perhaps uh, Sebastian, if you uh, if you wanted to answer the question about locally, how, you know, Jharkhand has had mines. So Sasha's question was to what extent was the formal economy larger uh, than what we see today. So if you want to come in on that and also on uh, the extent to which common property resources, so the uh, the guyans, the, the grazing grounds were uh, important and how they're shrinking today, why that is the case. In the case of Jharkhand, if you wanted to, um, perhaps even forests. Uh, so if you wanted to talk about that quickly and then uh, we'll yeah, close with Jens. Thank you for the questions. Uh... Now, about the mines in Jharkhand and particularly the whole of uh, tribal belt, including Odisha, Chhattisgarh, and Jharkhand. So these are the mines, the best coal mines, they say it is available here in, uh, in these central zone states. Now, there may be we doubt and we are uh, speculating that uh, this is the reason why on the tribal belt area, the development activities have not taken much because in the pretext of uh, mines and um, industrialization, a lot of things, the lands are grabbed, lands are taken and uh, uh, no other, uh, and also these uh, mines, minerals, Industrializations are happening, but local people are not given the chances, are not employed in this. And therefore, these people migrate. Now, what to do and how to do, we are uh, 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 trying to work out with the government here in Jharkhand that there should be some policy where the local people could be given the chances to work in these things. And agricultural development has to take place and it has otherwise no other means. And uh, after uh, the land taken for the mines and minerals or industrialization, the people here, they are, the compensation they get for the land, minimum of compensations, but they are not able to manage that money, uh, the asset which is immovable asset that they are like land, house, buildings that they are able to manage and it is sustainable for them but not the uh, compensation, compensated money. The second, uh, uh, what was exactly you framed the question? The question was more about uh, commons. So Grace oh, okay. and uh, exactly. Yes. Now here in the previous regime, that was uh, 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 now the current uh, uh, regime or the government is pro-tribal -tri and uh, he is a tribal chief minister and therefore he is a bit interested in this. But already the common property, actually it was it is to be under the Gram Sabha, that is the uh, most local uh, govern, uh, governing body of the village systems or panchayats we have. Under this, these common properties like uh, common grazing land, forest, or graveyards, or roads, or whatever it is, the common properties were under to be the Gram Sabha. Now, this has been taken, this has been taken and listed into the land bank. And now with a one click or with a single window system, they are allotting and giving away to the industrialization or the corporate families. 
and uh, they are grabbing and that is how uh, our the land the tribal people which uh, the land was the most uh, sustainable way of life for them it is now sinking and sinking uh, we are organizing all this but uh, how far we are able to do the moment we try to uh, uh, be vociferous on these issues we are also targeted and that's how our uh, those youth who those who are vociferous against all these land issues they are targeted and they are taken into the custody and into the jail and some those who are who are lucky then they escape as migrant workers these are the situations can you just add to that what Sebastian said about the single window system that Sebastian was uh, talking about? So the single uh, land records which details where the commons were on paper, and as they've been digitalizing land records in India, the people who've been digitalizing are just, they just, what uh, Sebastian said about land grabbing was literally that what is entered as common land on the paper suddenly becomes, like you said, within, with a click of a button becomes uh land government owned land and which can then which is then so you know there are rules whatever there are laws around it but they are just doing it through this you know uh, just wanted to clarify that thank you thanks um if i should start with the question of so has, has there ever been a bigger uh, formal uh, degree of formal employment in india well uh, I actually asked that question to a good colleague of mine, but she asked it because I couldn't figure out whether that was the case or not. And, and if anyone knows, it's him. Uh, he's, he's an expert on, on, on these things. He's a member of the uh, Commission uh, for the Informal Economy that was that uh, has written the first standard reports on the on the informal economy in India. He said, well, no one knows for sure, but his best guess was that it peaked around 1990. The reason for that is. That uh, uh, well, up until 1990, if you had more than 60% of the population working in agriculture, uh, so since 1990, that has fallen down to 40%. So, so you have people moving out from that to an area where there could be more formal. Uh, so, up to that, there couldn't be much formal because more people were, were in agriculture. Now, uh, what, what happened, and there wasn't much, uh, manufacturing was never significant. Before that, I but it was still these 10 12 percent. But what has happened since 1990 is that the formal manufacturing sector and other formal sectors have been hollowed out through uh, through the uh, 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 contractualization of labor, so that uh, so that going from having practically zero uh, percentage of of uh, non of non formal laborer employed in the formal sector to now having around 60 percent. So, so, so that's why it's gone down since then. So that's why he says 1990 is probably the point it was not. Can I just add to this that even public services mm -hmm. are yeah, free, yeah, yeah. So public right, services yeah. used to be such a big sector, yeah. or a reasonable sector for public employment, right. and now, yeah. And and if you look at the figures, it, um, uh, the the uh, informal sector was uh, according to the figures in 1990. It took out the informal economy, so both sector and informal job in the formal sector took up around 92% in 1990. Now it takes up around 90%. So formal the formal sector has increased a bit, and uh, but it has been hauled out. Even though this, as I mentioned, there is this more recent move. Where a new kind of formal or semi-formal employment is being established on these very very short-term contracts, so it's it's not real formal employment. And so 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 that's as much as I can say about that. Unions. Let me just say, just emphasize that I think Indians, Indian unions, do fantastic work in many areas. They this is just not what they do. And there, it's both because of that who the members are, also who the, they themselves are. If we accept that informalized labor is has is is much more low cost, uh, apologies, uh, Dalits, Adivasis, uh, um, uh, uh, etc. Uh, uh, formal sector workers are much more middle class and higher class. So there's also a cost difference who they are. So and people are blind to this. There's us white people in the north are race blind. So are our caste. Uh, people in India often also cast blind. So, um, 
<laughs> but, but it's a, but so so there are these tendencies, I think. Um, on on the caste system, uh, I mean, in a sense, caste system, as long as people marry inside their caste, which they don't always do, less maybe than before, but as long as they do that, the caste, caste exists. Um, but I think it has changed a lot in the last hundred years in India. It, it, it's, Shadow of of a Dalit is no longer polluting. Uh, I mean that, that is changed, but but what has what has not changed is that it works to create structural difference in the labor market. That certain groups are at the bottom when it comes to to work and assets, and and they stay there. That hasn't changed. That is, in my view, um, common land encroachment. It can go in many directions. Uh, there are uh, mainly just the powerful that take land. There are some very strong Dalit movements in, in, in Punjab and in Maharashtra that contest that and try to take land back. Uh, but, but mainly it is the well-off that take the common land. There are cases, such as in, in Himachal, where some of the of the of the nomadic groups uh, manage to take land. So it's not always so that it is the high caste that takes the land. So and then gets it. Uh, legalized later, but that is the general trend. Um, and last, legitimacy of the rural elites. I think that what a question that is. Uh, <laughs> where you can ask questions that, that none of us can ask. <laughs> how, how, the, how do rural elites maintain their legitimacy when they don't any longer employ all the uh, Dalits and the Adivasis? So they can't. They haven't got them like that. Where they where, where borrowing has also become more commercialized, moved away from that. How do they do it? Well, one way is connections, of course, because they still have the main political connections and therefore can be the, 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 the mediators. But I guess there is also a crisis in the system of, of legitimacy in that sense. So when the, the, the villages, the, the village I know, Dalits haven't got that respect from the, from, from the high caste that, that they used to have. But then there's the government system. I mean, it, it, it is the case that even on the BJP, the, the, the handouts have increased uh, to poor people, which is maybe why one reason why poor people, uh, Dalits and Adivasis, at least till quite recently, have been voting in much higher proportions uh, to on B, for BJP than many of us thought they would do. Um, so, 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 so there is maybe another kind of legitimacy. We might not get any kind of decent job, you might not get paid much, the government, there's some handouts. So, so that is maybe a different kind of legitimacy, not tied in so closely only to high caste. That's, I mean, I have no evidence for this. this. This is just my thinking. And I think on that, I should stop as well, thanks. Thank you. Um, so, Lothka, do you want to conclude? Thank you, yeah. thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah. With everyone for being here and listening. Thank you so much to the speakers. Um, which I know has left us, but um, Sebastian and Jens, uh, for all the knowledge that you've shared today. And um, uh, I think this has been a really uh, excellent start to what we hope will be a, a good long series because as we could see, there were so many points where we can talk a lot more than we have and there are many sectors we haven't covered and in, in, even in unionization i'm thinking oh, there is unionization of uh, uh, amongst um, amongst dalits and adivasi you know, people who have done that unionizing uh, a lot of them have been behind bars for doing it some are still there and we need to talk about that also so um thank you so much for this great start Sorry, sorry, a couple of things. Thank, thank you so much uh, to Ahan to make sure that the tech works today and Mika for uh, organizing as well. And uh, yeah, I think uh, the series will be a fascinating one because uh, we will, the next point that we want to get is the economy workers and how uh, uh, organizations can learn from each other and, and do that. Uh, but yeah, sorry. Sorry, just very briefly. Yeah, thank you for the debate. Um, just one thing on Monday night, there was a demonstration here about comments will be aware that the, the our right the government in the UK is also attacking workers' rights. So they've severely limited the right rights strike. And there's been another law to basically mean that in large part of the most union and bits of the economy, it will be impossible to have an all out strike. So that law will be voted on again in Parliament on Monday night. And there's a union demonstration at 6 p.m. Holland Square. So if you can come to that, please come. And if you're interested in those issues, we have 
from a campaign about that, or really thinking about that. <laughs> Thanks, Sebastian. Would you mind turning on your camera so we can, you know, see you and say thanks to you again? Thank you. Thanks. And thanks also online for joining and do follow the ILS.